Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever it is you're watching this, if you're watching live, thank you for joining me. If you are watching the replay, welcome. I am the curly hair doc, Chi Ohi, also known as at the Chi Ohi on all social media platforms. I mean, all social media platforms. Um, yeah, so today we are getting into dandruff. Dandruff, all right, I promised you guys a video for those of you who follow me on Instagram and those of you who are part of my Lazy Naturals hair group, I promised you a video on dandruff a while back. But as most of you know, I had a baby a while back and he's still, I'm still getting used to him. <laughs> so today we're talking about dandruff and the dry scalp and how they are incredibly different. They are not exactly the same thing. So let's get straight into it, shall we? Dandruff and dry scalp, dry scalp, particularly dandruff. What exactly is it? So dandruff, also known as seborrheic dermatitis, is the itchy, flaky, sometimes sometimes greasy, kind of scaly sort of uh, formation you get on your scalp when your scalp is irritated, unhappy, inflamed, and also dirty. So what you're experiencing is your scalp is exfoliating, and exfoliating just means cells are falling off, exfoliating your skin cells on your scalp. Now, most people know this as the whole snowflake appearance on the shoulders or when you, you know, you scratch your hair and you've got like flakes in your hands or on, it's on your combs. And it's, it's a common nuisance. It's a very, very, very common thing. At least, I think it's one in five people will experience it in any point in their lifetime. It starts or can begin in puberty and can just carry on from then on because it's usually a hormone driven thing because that's when we produce more oils in our body in general. Um, so what causes, it. Hold on. I think I've just talked about symptoms as well. What causes? <laughs> what causes it? So seborrheic dermatitis or uh, dandruff is caused by your scalp being irritated and oily. So for people who produce a lot of oil in general, you can have dandruff because you've produced too much oil. And I'll explain how and why that happens in a bit. So basically that can block your, your follicles that can irritate your scalp and your scalp is like, eh. And when it gets like that, it's like, okay, just kill everything, push everything off. It can also stimulate a an overproduction of cells, which can, which is why it has that, that's, for some people, it can have that um, kind of scaly, thick appearance. And you, yeah, I mean, if you've seen any of those, uh, it's not my thing. Pimple popping is my thing. Scaly, like dandruff removal videos, not my thing. If you've seen any of those on YouTube, you'll see what I mean. There are lots of different formations of it and the scaly, uh, you know, those greasy little plaque-like things coming off, sorry, TMI. But if you're watching this video, then it shouldn't be TMI. Um, if you watch those coming off, then you can see that's that's basically because of the overproduction of oil and overproduction or over, like overstimulation of production of cells, basically. Okay, so irritated oily scalp, um, not washing your hair enough. That's why I said dirty hair. So if you don't wash your hair enough, I'll still come back to it in detail in a bit. Microorganisms can flourish on your scalp. You will have a buildup of oil on your scalp and heaven help you if you happen to be part of the gang that oils your scalp. Hi, Kudzia, nice to see you. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I'm greeting everybody as I see the comments. Okay. Um, Yes, if you're the greasing, if you're part of the greasing scalp community, please, I beg you with God, eh, stop greasing your scalp. You will find out later on in this video. So hang in there. Let me explain to you in detail why greasing your scalp is not the one. Okay, so not washing your scalp enough. If you decide, some people say this thing that um, dirty hair grows faster. That's a myth. And I'm going to do a video later on where we are busting all the myths, all the myths. Okay, because I've heard a lot of them and it, sometimes it's like like a smack to the face, like, what is this? <laughs> Dirty hair does not grow faster. As I've just explained, block it, blocked follicles don't grow hair very nicely. They, in fact, they're very annoyed. They're very unhappy. So um, not washing enough. Contact dermatitis. Contact dermatitis is when something touches your skin, your skin absolutely hates it, doesn't like it very much and reacts badly to it. So contact dermatitis can be a way or a reason why, like I said, it causes inflammation or irritation, which goes to inflammation, which is how your skin can start to do that thing where it's overproducing oils, overproducing cells, and then exfoliating all those cells. Um, psoriasis and eczema can also present with those flaky, greasy, plaque-like scales that fall off. Those two things I will come to in a different video, but we're gonna focus on my last cause of 
dermato um dermat using the wrong word, seborrheic dermatitis, which is malassezia. It is a fungus. Now, malassezia is a fungus that actually lives on your skin normally. The reason why it lives there is because we have lots of things that live on our skin. It's called normal microflora. It doesn't become a pain until something causes it to overgrow. So malassezia likes to eat our sebum, or at least the triglycerides. Sorry, that's a big old chemistry word, but it's the triglycerides in our sebum. So the sebum is the oil that our skin produces. Our skin, that's what's making my face shiny at the moment. <laughs> it's what makes our hair shiny as it's growing out of the scalp. And it's what also keeps our, our scalp protected from the elements and so on and so forth. So when we have too much of that oil being produced, the malassezia is like, wow, this is a buffet. Let's, let's eat all the oil we can eat. And then they grow and they grow. And in, um, in dandruff situations, Malassezia has been found to be in a population of 1.5 to two times more than what you would expect it to be um, present in on, an, on a person who's not experiencing derm, um, what I keep saying, I keep wanting to say dermatitis. Yes, it's seborrheic dermatitis, but I'm trying to say dandruff. <laughs> That's the word I'm trying to say. So yeah, it can double itself in, in population and that irritates the scalp. Imagine a tiny little, a, a bunch of tiny little microorganisms eating things that are coming out of your follicles. It, it's just, it's not. And of course, they, as they're metabolizing whatever they're metabolizing, they're producing waste products and your skin is not going to enjoy that. It's, we have a way to manage it when there are not too many of them. But when microorganisms overgrow, when there's too many of them, our body starts to have a really negative reaction to it. So how do we treat this situation? Oh, wait, no, before I get there, let's go back to the fungus. <sighs> Again, going back to the greasing hair community. So if you're one of the people that likes to grease your scalp, think about it. It eats the oil, the fatty acids in your sebum, which is an oil. You now put oil on your scalp. You're giving it more to eat. You're creating an even bigger buffet. So that's why when people say that their instinct when they're experiencing dandruff is to, oh, my scalp is dry, let me grease it. That's the wrong thing to do. What you're doing is providing more food for the, for the fungus. So please don't do that. All right, now let's get on to treatments. Treatments, how do we treat uh, dandruff? And so there are two kinds of treatments. You've got your antifungals and you've got your exfoliants. Antifungals include things like ketoconazole, which is a, it's an, anti, well, it's an antifungal. It's one of the strongest and the best ones in the market at the moment. There's zinc pyrothione and basically, when you go to a pharmacist, you don't have to go to a doctor for um, dandruff unless you're not sure it's dandruff. If you go to a pharmacist and ask them, what can I take or what can I use for my dandruff to get rid of it? They will give you a shampoo or a cream to put on your scalp that will contain either ketoconazole, zinc pyrothione, um, selenium disulfide or cyclopyrox. Now, I don't know how common cyclopyrox is in the UK, so I won't talk too much about that. But all those others are what you will see. So when you see these strange names on the, on the bottle, don't be afraid of them. They're just there to kill the fungus. In fact, zinc pyrothion is actually also good at killing bacteria as well. So if you're struggling with, for example, those little bumps on your scalp, where let's say, for example, you just did your hair and you've got bumps in your scalp and they have like pus on them or in them and they're sore, that's kind of zinc pyrothion can help to kill the bacteria that are causing that sort of irritation. Okay, so that's the antifungal treatments. You can also use an exfoliant treatment. That would be shampoos that contain things like coal tar, which helps to just remove all those dead cells and the scales and the, and the flakes as well. That helps to just remove all of those. Salicylic acid, hyaluronic acid. There is a fourth one, but I can't remember and I forgot to write it down. So <laughs> I can't remember. This is the thing when I record a video and then I don't get around to doing anything with it. At the time, things just leave my brain. Anyway. But those are the treatments. So what you will be asked to do when you get that kind of treatment is to shampoo your hair twice a week. Well, because we are, um, I'm talking about black hair and I'm talking about uh, black scalps, we have what is believed to be a lower production of sebum than um, anybody from any other ethnicity really. Um, and because we suffer from dryness a lot more, using harsh shampoos frequently, because I actually, I, it's usually advised for you to use the shampoo up to three times a week 
I would say two times a week. Just make sure that you do it twice a week and do it regularly. Every single week you need to do it twice a week. Um, those shampoos are, yes, they are very harsh. They can really strip, they're supposed to, they're supposed to strip away the, the nastiness and particularly all those excess cells, the nasty um, fungus or the bacteria that's harming your scalp and just leave your scalp clean so that it can start to regenerate itself and produce sebum at a normal level again. So that's what you'd be asked to do, wash it twice a week. If you're gonna end up having to wash your hair twice a week, you will have to deep condition. And I have a really quick tip for that. If you want to deep condition, um, okay, so there are treatments that you can use that don't invite in, involve you uh, sitting down and putting a steam cap on your head for like an hour or 20 minutes or anything like that. If you don't have time, there are two minute deep conditioning treatments. Things like uh, the Aussie two minute, two minute, I'm gonna put it on my Instagram story. So go follow me on Instagram at, at the Chiohi. I'm just gonna pop that on the screen so that you can see it. Uh, where is it? At the Chiohi or anywhere else that you're at. If you search me anywhere, that's that's where you'll that's what you will find me as. Follow me on Instagram and that's where I post a lot of my good stuff. The best stuff though is in my group, which is the Lazy Naturals group. I'll put that on the screen as well. On Facebook. There we go. So, um, quick tip for that. Yes, two, two minute conditioners can help to replenish your hair when you're shampooing that frequently. Um, okay, another thing that can also cause or stimulate or co just basically trigger dandruff is a change in the oils of your whole body because you're taking some sort of hormonal medication. I have to mention this because we're women and we sometimes take hormonal medications or um, like for example, yeah, let's just stick with the hormonal medications. Hormonal medications that are gonna change how your oils are produced can also trigger dandruff. Apparently, statistically, men suffer from dandruff more than women do because they produce more oils because their hormones are different and their hormone levels are different they suffer from it more than we do. So if you're a guy watching this, thank you for watching. Um, and apologies and sorry for, for the fact that, that that could possibly be something that happened to you more often than it would to women. But yeah, jokes aside, that's how you treat it. Okay, moving on to prevention. Now, I mentioned earlier this myth of dirty hair grows faster. It does not. I don't know where that myth comes from. I think it's the thing where people put their hair in a style and leave it for a while and by the time they take it out, they've retained their length, that's great. But not washing in between is not helping your hair. That's not what's happening. What's making the hair grow is the fact that you didn't touch it for a month or whatever it was. But counteracting that whole situation was the fact that you didn't wash it. So washing your hair regularly would help to get rid of excess oils. Thank you, Kitty. Um, can I post, I'll post the zinc one again actually, yeah. Actually, zinc. I'll put that on screen. Pyrithion. There we go. It's not the most popular one. It exists. It it does its job, but um, it's not. It's the most popular one, and that works quite well. Is ketoconazole. Um, but yeah, zinc pyrithion is also one that's okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about anything like side effects or anything like that today because there aren't very many. And if you're only using it twice a week for a few weeks, I think you end up having to use it for six weeks. If it doesn't clear after six weeks, you might be you might need to go back to your pharmacist and uh, get them to have a look at it again. Or if it's if it gets more serious, then maybe it's not dandruff that's happening. Maybe something else is happening. Hi, Maureen. Thank you for joining me. Um, and you're welcome, KG. Thank you for asking a question. I love questions, by the way. Drop me any questions in the sec in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer immediately or as soon as possible. Okay, prevention, right. So washing regularly. If you're not washing your hair as a, as, a, as a person of color, if you're not washing your hair at least once a week, we don't need to wash our hair every single day. That's, we don't produce enough sebum for that to be a thing. And our se the sebum that we produce in our scalp doesn't reach down to the ends of our hair as quickly as it does in white hair or Asian hair or any other nationality, that, nationality ethnicity that has straight hair. Because of our curly hair, it just doesn't travel down like that. So we don't need to wash every single day and it actually isn't great for our hair for us to wash every day. But to prevent dandruff from being a thing, to prevent the malassezia from overgrowing and to prevent all sorts of other things, including those bumps I mentioned, washing at least once a week, twice a week would be great, but once a week is fine. Once a week is fine. Leaving it, I would say, at the very worst, if you don't have time, tw 
every fortnight without fail every fortnight get your hair washed it just prevents all these just all this harassment and all this additional stress that we don't need it prevents it so like i said gets rid of excess sebum gets rid of the germs gets rid of all the cells because if the cells are still left on your scalp and you don't get rid of them they'll block your you know, they'll block your follicles and cause you know more problems irritation so on and so forth like i mentioned earlier and you don't want that so next point Oh yes, drinking lots of water, stay healthy, because if your immune system is down, if you're feeling run down, you're more susceptible to infection from something like malassezia. Okay, so we've blitzed through <laughs> everything to do with dandruff and how to prevent it. Now let's go into dry scalp and why it is completely different. The appearance of dandruff makes you think, because of the scales falling off and they're dry and they're dead, it looks like you have a dry scalp, but that's not what's happening. And the instinct is, let's put some oil on our scalp or let's put some aloe vera on our scalp. Not a good idea. Aloe vera will help to soothe the scalp, but oil, whew. Now let's get into the stuff I found in terms of research as to what oils can do to your scalp. Oils are, especially the ones that we like to use to treat our scalp. Things like castor oil, things like coconut and shea and olive things like coconut, shea, and castor oil in particular, think about how thick they are, then think about what your scalp is like. Like your scalp is like your face. Would you put coconut oil or olive oil on your face? Or shea butter. I wouldn't put shea butter on my face because it would it's heavy, it's sticky, it would block my pores. And if it did that, <laughs> I'd have quite the breakout. Now on your scalp, what happens instead is it blocks your pores, your pores get annoyed, they get irritated, which like I keep going through the same, the same cycle, irritation, inflammation, very unhappy scalp, very unhappy scalp. And it can't grow very well. Your, your hair cannot grow very well under those circumstances. So actually greasing our scalp doesn't make very much sense. And now let me get on to olive oil because that's a serious one. Olive oil contains a high amount of something called oleic acid. Oleic acid is very, very yummy, very good for you in terms of it's good for the body, inside your body. When you put it on your skin, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> when you put it on your skin, however, it is able to disrupt the surface level of your skin, which in some ways is a good thing in terms of allowing moisture in or whatever, but that disruption can allow things like malassezia to get a proper grip on your scalp and do some serious damage. So putting something like olive oil on your scalp is not a very good idea. Now here's, there are some other oils that contain that as well. Things like, nobody puts canola oil on their hair, but I just thought I'd mention it. Um, palm oil, nobody puts that on their hair either, but I'd mention it. Sea buckthorn and grapeseed oil. Grapeseed oil is nice for the hair, not so nice for the scalp. Don't put it on your scalp. Okay. Um, oh yeah, that disruption, that disruption, like I mentioned, also causes water loss from the, from the skin. So when you use something like olive oil on your skin, strangely enough, it also depends on what kind of olive oil you're using, but yeah, we're not going to that today. You can, you can actually end up with drier skin. The same thing is, it, it, the same thing kind of goes for coconut oil. If you've ever tried to do a coconut oil skin cleanse, like if you've ever tried double cleansing, I use coconut oil for double cleansing because it dissolves the oils on my face. And then when it's washed off, it washes off clean. The kind of soap you can make with, oil, with coconut oil is a very strongly cleansing oil because of what it's made of. So you don't want to create dry skin by disrupting your, your skin layer. Coconuts and olive oils are penetrating oils. And that's what I mean by it disrupts your skin, skin barriers. You want to then go in afterwards with something that will uh, protect the skin again. Yes, I know. It's very, uh, it's, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Okay. So oleic acid, I put a lot of castor oil and coconut oil on my scalp. Honestly, some people do this routinely, putting a lot of castor oil and coconut oil on their scalp and they've been okay. I'm saying that's happening in spite of what you're doing. You're, you're okay in spite of it. It has the potential. Yeah. Castor oil. Oh, I haven't mentioned it. I will talk about that in a second. So the potential of these oils is to just, like I said, coconut oil will disrupt the scalp layer, the skin barrier, which leaves the skin actually vulnerable to infection and all sorts of other things. Castor oil 
can bl- yeah for some people cast- coconut oil irritates the scalp yeah a, a lot of people at one point the natural hair community went nuts over coconut oil oh yeah put it on your put it on your hair put it on your scalp put it on your face put it on your finances your kids getting on your nerves put it on your kids the, everybody went nuts about coconut oil then all of a sudden videos started popping up about how coconut oil is horrible oh it's the devil's this it's the devil's i'm just like people go from one extreme to the other extreme and i'm like why don't we do more research? There is no magic silver bullet that will solve all our problems or and magically grow our hair. It's literally just finding the right method and sticking to that method. It is so simple once we know how to do it. And that's that's why I'm on YouTube. That's literally the reason why I'm doing all of this. Because once people know, it won't be a thing anymore. I won't even, I'll be out of a job because nobody will need hair coaches because everybody knows how to take care of their hair. Okay, so going back to castor oil. Castor oil is thick, sticky, Thick and sticky, just think about thick and sticky, putting it on your face. Um, my pores would be blocked. Same thing goes for your follicles on your scalp. Once you block your follicles on your scalp, they get irritated, unhappy, won't grow hair very well. They might to begin with. And here's the other thing. So some people say, use your use castor oil to, uh, to thicken your hair. I wonder what they mean by that because there are two ways you can say you're thickening your hair. You can thicken the density of your hair like you have more strands on your head. That's not, that's a thing you can do if you're, if you didn't have the maximum density you were capable of by your, you know, as demanded by your genetics or dictated by your genetics. That, but that's not something that you do using castor oil. That's something you do using diet, exercise, good sleep and taking care of yourself. That's how you maximize your genes. Castor oil can make the hair strands look thicker because it's so thick. Think about how we see things. When we see things, the light bounces off the thing and we see it, if that makes any sense. It bounces back into our eyes, it reflects into our eyes and we see that thing. If I put castor oil on my hair, it's thick and it will also reflect light. Putting castor oil on my hair, let's say something like this, 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 um, this amount of hair, if I put castor oil on this, it will stick the hair together. It will coat each strand nicely, absolutely, but it will make my hair look thicker when my hair in actual fact isn't thicker. So that's that's untrue when people say, oh, your hair is thicker. No, you can't make your hair strands thicker. They are what they are, you know, you, especially if you're already at maximum you know, potential. Basically you have your genes, your genes dictate how thick your hair strands can be and how much, how many strands you have on your head. If you're healthy, you're resting enough, you're drinking enough, eating well, you're not vitamin deficient in any way, then you've got, you've pretty much got everything going well for you. Now, I'm not completely bad mouthing oils entirely and saying never put anything on your scalp. I'm saying don't leave them there. I've already said which ones, I say don't put them on your scalp at all. I don't even think there's any benefit to putting them on your scalp. There are some oils that there is an, is a benefit to putting on your scalp. Things like jojoba oil, which I think I'll pop it on the screen so you can see it. And if you want to write it down, you can. Um, oh, all right, okay, I haven't done too many. So jojoba oil is actually in texture and in, um, Fatty acid, fatty acid content a lot like our own sebum. So it has a similar texture to our sebum. It also does not block pores. It is completely non-comedogenic. Comedogenic means something that can block your pores and cause a breakout. So you could even put that on your skin and it won't cause a breakout. If you're really, really sensitive, I would not even, I don't like putting oils just on my skin like that and just leaving it. But once upon a time, I used to wash my face and then I would use jojoba oil for my skin and it was it was actually thriving. Anyway, that and now pairing that with certain essential oils can help to stimulate blood flow, which would be good for your scalp, which would encourage hair growth. But let's not go back to the malassezia thing. Let's leave the malassezia alone. That's enough of malassezia for one day. But yeah, in health, in your health, when your scalp and your hair are healthy, putting a little bit of a hobart oil with your um, essential oils in it, things like peppermint oil rosemary oil oh, thinking about all my favorites because this was not planned it's just, just it kind of sprung out of the discussion about oils in your scalp but yeah things like peppermint peppermint any oil that kind of heats up your skin and that you it feels hot when you put it on that's the kind of thing that you're feeling that warmth because you're, you're it's a vasodilator it's opening up your blood vessels which is causing more blood flow to that area which is nice so um it's nice for your your scalp basically um Okay, so you dilute that with like just a few drops to about a tablespoon of your jojoba oil. Put that in your scalp 
as a pre-poo, as in you're going to wash it off. Don't leave it in your hair, please. <laughs> Greasing our scalp, like I said, we don't want to put too much oil on our scalp. We already have enough oil on our scalp. Do you know, I'm gonna be honest, I have not oiled my scalp in years. When I discovered that oiling my scalp was actually exacerbating, making my problems worse, I stopped doing it. And ever since, my scalp's been fine. What tends to happen is we grease our scalp. Our scalp thinks, oh, I don't need to produce so much oil. There's too much oil here anyway. And then it might stop. But in the meantime, we'll be suffering from dandruff because we've greased our scalp. The malassezia has something to eat. So it's like, wow, there's a big old party here. Let's party. You know what I mean? So we're suffering cycles of things that we're doing to ourselves that we didn't realize we were doing. I have not greased my scalp in years. I didn't need to. The only thing I've done is what I just suggested to you, which is I've diluted my peppermint oil or whatever in my, in my jojoba oil and put a bit on my scalp before washing. I then go in and wash. It protects my scalp from being too stripped when I wash, um, wash off my, what am I saying? When I wash my hair. <laughs> so yeah, it can be a nice treatment. It, it's basically, it's, it's, it feels nice. You know, like how you, uh, you can use something like Vicks or anybody who, who knows this particular brand from Nigeria, Rub. You can use that for a nice massage that will penetrate the muscles. That, that warm feeling comes from your blood vessels opening up. So that's a good thing. But yeah, like I said, you don't want to leave those things on your skin. Let's move on. Dry scalp. So this is, it's actually fairly rare. Dry scalp is not a common thing per se. Um, but when people are experiencing it, the most common reason they might be experiencing it is harsh shampoo. So sometimes we buy drugstore shampoo, just the box standard brand, and it's it contains harsh sulfates, which sulfates are good for cleaning your hair very well, but they can also be incredibly harsh on your skin. That can cause irritation. So when you, when you strip your scalp too much of the oils that are there, your skin might be traumatized by how harsh that chemical was, and it'll take a while for it to start producing sebum again because it's irritated. That's, that's part of the issue. Then if anything else irritates or causes inflammation on your scalp, that can cause a reduction in the production of sebum leading to a dry scalp as well. If you also, and, these, and now I'm getting towards the more rare conditions that can lead to a dry scalp, an autoimmune condition where your immune system is attacking your scalp, that can cause a dry scalp. And if you have a genetic predisposition to an underproduction of sebum, that can cause a dry scalp as well. So these are not common things. Um, the only thing on there that was common was the harsh shampoo one because we are very susceptible to that, very susceptible to that as black people. Thank you, KG. I'm so happy that you were all able to join me today. That's great. Um, okay, so let's talk about a little bit more about this uh, dry scalp situation. So I've talked about how sh um, harsh shampoos can irritate your scalp, which then leads to dry scalp. Now let's talk about the interesting things that could happen if somebody has more genetic or more medical conditions that are causing their dry scalp. For example, there's this thing called asteatotic <laughs> eczema. So eczema is a common condition. That's dry skin in general. So when your skin is just, it is an autoimmune condition as well. Um, that's your immune system attacking your, your skin. Hi, Bola, lovely to have you here. Honestly, you don't need to do it. Sorry, I'm just answering Maureen's question. Do we grease our scalp when we braid our hair? You don't need to. I'm telling you the truth. You do not need to. And it's honestly, it was a battle to stop doing it. It really was. Because the habit is plait your hair, grease your scalp. Do you know what you need to grease? Your hair. Because it makes the hair softer and it seals in the moisture into your hair. But you don't need to grease it. I promise you. Stop doing it. Give yourself some time. Give yourself some time. The only thing that tends to happen, especially for some of us that travel to hot countries or expose ourselves to the sun during the summer, we'll get our hair done. Then we're leaving the hair out to be seen, obviously, because you didn't do your hair to cover it up with a hat, no. And then we're exposed to the sun. You know, the sun can burn your scalp. You may not notice it. It may not burn you enough for you to notice it. It'll burn your scalp, which can then reduce the sebum production. It'll make that scalp area feel irritated and dry because I just talked about the dry area, the, you know, the dry scalp thing and irritation can cause, you know, uh, dry scalp. I know, I know. So um, I think, I don't know if you were here when I said this, 
My scalp is always dry though, and then I end up with dandruff. You missed it, you missed it. So you've just joined me and I've just explained how that happens. So what tends to happen is we think that the dandruff is because our scalp is dry. That's not what's causing the dandruff, it's the opposite. When our scalp is too greasy, we get dandruff because the, the scalp gets irritated. So think about like if you were to take Vaseline and just rub it on your face, what would happen? Just think about that and then think about your scalp. When we grease our scalp, that's what we're doing. We're rubbed at, but there's an additional factor. That's the fungus that already lives there because it likes to eat our, our own natural oils. It eats our natural oils. You now put, yeah, no, that's okay. That's okay. You can, you can watch the replay and it's right at the beginning and I did it really quickly. So it'll be quick to get through, but it's so, it really baffles people when I tell them, when I tell them like, this is actually how this works. And they're like, eh? <laughs> because that is how it works. So you put something, especially when we use natural oils, we put, our natural oils on our hair, something like shea butter, it's nice. Natu Look, shea butter is beautiful for the skin, but our scalp is different. For this skin, not our face skin, our face skin and our hair skin, different, completely different. You put that on your scalp, you block your pores. The Malassezia is like, ooh, natural oils, let's eat. It's a big old buffet. They eat plenty, they grow plenty. Our scalp is like, what the hell is going on? They irritate our scalp and then we get those thick, greasy, nasty plaques and those flakes. And we think it's dryness and we think, oh, let's go get some more cream and put on our scalp. You're making it worse. You're making it worse. I say I haven't greased my scalp in years and my hair is happy and fine and my scalp is not suffering. It's not. Here's the other thing. A lot of us use things that come from, we just buy it from anywhere and just start w washing our scalp with it. We wash our scalp or we wash our hair and then we have dry scalp right? And this is, this is in, still an answer to Bola's question about um, um, scalp being dry. Um, so that harsh shampoo has irritated our scalp. We'll start scratching, scratching, scratching because it's itching. Of course it's itching. Your scalp is irritated. The, the, the shampoo was too harsh, but we didn't know that and we won't make the connection unless we already know information like this. So the scalp, the scalp is itching. Then we think, oh, let me go and get some oil and oil my scalp. Yikes. That's not the thing to do. So when you, what you need to do to your scalp or what you can do to your scalp when it's feeling like that is use something like aloe vera. And honestly, I would advocate using fresh aloe vera, not the stuff that we buy from like Amazon or not from anywhere. It has to be just aloe vera, really. I'm using at the moment something that contains aloe vera, hyaluronic acid and citric acid. Hyaluronic acid is good for exfoliating dead cells. It helps to get rid of them, but it's also good at drawing moisture towards the scalp or towards your skin, because it's something that you'll find in a lot of your skincare products. So it's very, very good for your skin. So I picked that product, or I was happy to use that product because it had only aloe vera, only hyaluronic acid, which I get, like I said, was, is very good for that kind of thing. And um, of course, citric acid, which is to preserve it. So it's not gonna go off and, you know, cause infection on my scalp. So it kill, that, the citric acid helps to kill germs, basically. So it, that's, that's a good thing to put on your scalp. I'll actually put that on my Instagram as well. I'll show you, show you guys on my Instagram probably should write this down so I don't forget things I'm showing on my Instagram two minute conditioner so yeah that's much better to put on your scalp than uh than uh oils oils blocking our scalp is blocking our pores is not great um two minute conditioner and what did I just say the aloe vera thing that I use aloe vera it's much better it feels so much nicer as well because it's nice and cool It'll stop the irritation and it will start to heal that, that irritation a bit as well. Okay, let's get back into it so I don't spend forever here because, I don't know, people don't like to sit and watch 40-minute videos. That's kind of, <laughs> it's a lot. Um, okay, so, God, I can't speak today. Asteatotic eczema. <laughs> so, asteatotic just basically means hyposecretion or no secretion of sebum or oil stay at stay at is to do with oil anyway so the it comes from uh the cracked appearance of your scalp when um when you suffer from this kind of thing um i would like to show a picture actually i saw it somewhere here yes show you this is what skin looks like when it suffers from this kind of thing let me share it with you guys share screen pick tab real quick where am i where am i where am i share <laughs> sorry because I, I wasn't actually planning to do that, but let's do it. Where are we? Yeah. That, I don't know if you can see that. So that's that cracked appearance that I was talking about when you suffer from this kind of thing. Now, what causes this? The thing that causes this is from, it goes, it's water loss through the skin from a genetic predisposition 
injury by environmental factors such as sun and uh, well, things that you can find in the water, like just basically un unpleasant environmental factors can cause your skin to be um, cause your skin barrier to be broken, which can then lead to water loss from the skin. I would also say dry skin, and this is separate to the aesthetic, aesthetic eczema. <laughs> separate to that, we lose a lot of water from our skin when we are using harsh things on our skin because we've broken the barrier and then we don't drink water. That's why it really matters for us to replenish our water in our bodies frequently. Sorry, I'm looking, I can see some questions popping up. Oh, what's, what's which one called Sister K? I didn't, I didn't quite, because I, I didn't see when, when that message came up. Was it just now? Or the, I don't know. <laughs> Ask me again in full, because I, I, don't, I don't know which, what is what called. Okay. Um, so absence or hyposecretion of sebum, water loss through the skin from predis, predisposition through your genes or injury by your environmental factor, factors, including things like low humidity. We live in a really, yeah, I'll write it because it's easier to write for me right now. I think I must be very tired. <laughs> I stay at totic. There we go. Oh, good grief. All right. There we go. It's not. There we go. <laughs> All right. Or maybe I should do a banner and then just know that I've done it. And it's on the screen. And the kind of person that would be able to diagnose this for you if you suspect you have it. If you've always suffered with dry skin and your skin is so dry that it cracks, I'm, I'm pretty sure you would have already seen somebody about it by now anyway, but they would they would be able to tell um, if you have it, if they are a dermatologist. A dermatologist is the right person to see. A GP might not even be able to recognize this. Might, might. Everybody has different experiences when it comes to medicine, but in terms of dermatology, for somebody like a GP, they have literally only done, I think they do two weeks of a dermatology rotation. So they don't get the chance to see everything. They've read about a lot of things, but how much how much sticks in your brain deter is determined by how much you do, like how much, how much you use that information. You know what I mean? I use hair information a lot, which is why it's in my head. <laughs> okay, so going back to this uh, eczema of a situation. Um, excessive bathing, I know this one, is something we could suffer from, black people could suffer from because we're used to bathing a lot because back home, it's hot, it's humid. You go to, you wake up in the morning, you bath, come back from work, you're gonna have to bath because it's dust in the air, how hot it's been all day, you're gonna need to bath again. So if you come back, if you come here where it's dry in the atmosphere with those same habits, you're going to damage your skin. I know this because to some degree I've suffered this kind of, I, while reading up for some of these things, over the last few years, I discovered what I, you know, what was tr troubling me, over overdoing it with the bath thing, and not then going in afterwards to look after your skin. Because if you're going to disrupt your skin barrier, or you're going to use very harsh things, things like soap and bathing detergents. Now, when I say bathing detergents, I mean, you know, things like our Dove uh, Dove wash that can be har harsh. It depends on what your skin is like. Um, I'm not a skin specialist. I'm not gonna, not going to go too much into this, but. I'm just saying, I was talking about this because it can affect your scalp too, and that can cause hair loss. So anything that will affect your scalp and make your scalp unhappy can cause hair loss. And I'm trying to prevent hair loss. That's the whole point of all this that I'm doing. Um, it tends to affect older people. Yellow, oh yeah, yeah, I'll post, I'll post it on my, on my um, the aloe vera products. I'll post a link to it in my description box when I finish this, but I'll also post a picture of it on my Instagram. So I've written notes down so I won't forget to do it. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, complications, sorry. Yeah, you can, you can inherit the predisposition to this. If your skin is already kind of dry, I have generally, it's such a complicated thing with me in particular. I have dry skin on my body and my face is greasy. It's just weird. It's combination face, like combination, combination skin. Here is greasy. Here is dry. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. So that can affect your scalp as well. But again, I said a, a uh, astiatotic eczema is not that common. So it might be a thing people are suffering with. Go see a, G, uh, a GP who will then refer you to a dermatologist if you think that this is what's going on. But there is there are ways to treat it. And these treatments work quickly. So if you have skin that is sensitive or dry, these tips will work for you as well. 
Um, so using a cream cleanser rather than harsh soap, soap is very, very good at cleaning, especially depending on what it's made of, it can be very, very good at stripping everything, including all your natural oils and the top layer of your skin off. Um, use a cream cleanser instead and take less frequent baths. So if you're bathing twice a day, maybe only do that during the summer, during the winter months, only bath once a day and maybe bath at the least hot time of the day. Um, quick emo thick emollients and moisturizers, things like E45. So my, my daughter has eczema, so we use a cream cleanser for her anyway. And then we go back in with uh, thick emollients. She has a special one that I can't remember the name of, but it's like E45, but even thicker. E45 would be good. For my own skin, I put the my lotion and then I put on a thicker one on top as well because I'll put all of that on and I'll still be dry later on. It's just, I don't understand it. But yeah, looking after ourselves is just so important. Taking taking the time to do that for your skin is actually good for your mental health as well. And of course, you know I can't go through a whole, I can't go through a video and not talk about mental health because I believe in your whole health adding up to the health of your hair. So taking care of yourself, taking time for yourself, taking time to just enjoy pampering yourself. I, I, I don't have time for that often. I managed to do that the other day. I felt like a different human. I felt like a different person afterwards. I felt so good. So taking care of yourself is really important. Um, okay. And a mild, okay, so if it's an extreme eczema, you might need a mild topical steroid for inflamed areas for a few days. Only if it's extending for a long time would you need to use more. Um, use it for longer and you might need a slightly stronger steroid. But that's all stuff that you can get I mean, the, the steroid, the previous stuff you can do just by talking to your pharmacist, the steroid and the stronger steroid, you talk to your GP about that kind of thing. So to sum it all up, because I've been talking for a really long time, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I really hope that I've been helpful in some way. If I'm just gonna go back real quick, seborrheic dermatitis and dry skin, not the same thing. The appearance of dry skin can look like derm um, seborrheic dermatitis, it's really important to, first of all, eradicate the factors that are that could be causing it, i.e. not washing often enough, um, not drinking your water, that's that's a separate thing, but yeah, drink, drink, you have to drink your water. Um, irritating your scalp with things like oils that don't need to be on your scalp because your scalp is, is actually producing enough oils. Actually, that's something I forgot. So going back to Sister Bola's question earlier, um, when I, I was talking about shampoos and how harsh they can be, when we strip our scalp of our oils frequently, our body reacts to that and it's, it adjusts to that. It's like, oh, well, if we keep washing off that oil, maybe we don't need so much oil. So I'm going to produce less. So to begin with, after you, if you follow this advice that I've just given you, to begin with, you may experience a period where your scalp is still unhappy and dry. You, because, and that's because your scalp is not used to producing enough oil to keep itself happy because you keep washing it away. So our, our scalp becomes quote unquote lazy. Our, our bodies adjust to what we're experiencing. So that's when you would use that aloe vera product that I, again, I'm gonna mention, I'll put it on my Instagram. If you're new here, my Instagram is that. Okay, um, so to begin with, it'll still feel dry. Just apply your aloe vera. I do it for my, um, for my daughter as well because she has a dry scalp as well as dry skin. Um, after a while, your skin will return to producing oil the normal way by itself. If you're taking any hormonal medication, that can also affect you. So if it's it's worth kind of, if you think it's a serious issue and it's not been repaired by, I don't know, using your antifungal treatments or, you know, um, just washing frequently and so on and so forth, changing your shampoo so it's not too harsh. Um, if it's not been cured by any of that, then see your GP and talk to them about maybe, I think one of my medications is having an effect on my scalp they may not know what you're talking about because I mentioned earlier, they don't get the most, they, they, it depends on experience, it really does. If your experience with, um, let's say for example, I've been adopted for 10 years, if I've only ever lived in Ascot, I will only encountered a certain number of black people and they may not have experienced all this rain, these ranges of different issues. Do you know what I mean? I will not experience the types of things that will require me to read the kind of things I need to read to know more you know what I mean, or to, to have to access that part of my memory all the time. So they might not they might not have that at the forefront of their brain. I remember when I took my daughter to my G, to one of the GPs in the surgery I, we have here, she told me to put coconut oil on my daughter's hair. And I was like, 
I mentioned jojoba oil. She had no idea what I was talking about. She said, no, yeah, just try the coconut oil. She seems very uncomfortable with conversation. I was just like, okay, so it looks like I'm on my own on this one. However, if anybody's looking for a dermatologist uh, I for help with that kind of issue that specializes in, in black skin, I do know one or two that are specialists in black skin particularly, and they have they take special interest in our own skin issues, what it appears like in our, our skin issues. Um, and I would be very, very happy to direct you to them. But in the meantime, we've covered everything. <laughs> so if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the comment section. Thank you for being so engaged and asking questions and you know interacting with me. I absolutely love that. If you have any ideas for what you would like me to react to next Wednesday, or if you'd like to suggest something that I can talk about next Friday, because I do twice a week, a video on Wednesday, a video on Friday, live, naturally. Um, if you have anything that you'd like me to talk about, just put them in the comment section or Instagram me or Facebook me, anything, and I'll be happy to look into it. In the meantime, thank you. Take very good care of yourselves. May your skin glow and your hair grow. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you, Sister Bola. <laughs>